Hi, this is Eric from The Robust Marketer. And before we get into our podcast this week, I just wanted to take a minute first to do a few things. First of all, to thank everyone who's uh, followed us on this journey at iStack Training, who's watched our Robust Marketer podcasts, uh, and has left comments, who's subscribed and shared our content. I want to thank you so much for helping us grow this amazing thing. Um, today is a really interesting day. First of all, it's my 25th podcast uh, that I've done here at iStack Training with The Robust Marketer. 25 amazing conversations um, that, that people tell me have, have brought a lot of value to the performance marketing space. It's also my one-year anniversary of starting iStack Training with the team from Stack That Money, STM Forums, and Affiliate World Conferences. Uh, in this year, we have done a lot of stuff. We have uh, created two live events that we've sold out. We have created three master level classes. One of those courses we ran three times. Uh, we created five uh, smaller modules that we call acceleration modules, all based on these amazing relationships we've been working out with some of the best marketing minds of this generation. Uh, and today's conversation will be no exception. I'm really excited to get to it. But if you watch these podcasts, and I know that there's a lot of you out there that do, I every you know every time I go to a, a trade show, when I just went to Las Vegas or when I was in Thailand before that, I had dozens and dozens of people who came up to me and said how much they like the conversations that we're having here, how much value they think that we're we're sort of creating in these conversations and sharing, uh, and you know, and that's that's the most amazing thing about all of this is how much all of these people that that, that we're working with are willing to share their deep insights with the idea that they can help the whole industry grow. Uh, and, and so basically that's what I'd like to ask of you. If you like the podcast, if you like the videos from YouTube or on Facebook, tell someone about them. Go out there and share them. Hit the share button if you see us on Facebook. Uh, go subscribe if you haven't already on YouTube. Uh, just just help, us, uh, help us grow this thing because we, uh, we think that we're having some really valuable conversations here. And, uh, and we wanna keep having better and better conversations, more of them. We wanna keep going around the world doing live podcasts. We've got a live podcast coming up in San Diego at Traffic and Conversion Summit that I'm really looking forward to. Um, but yeah, so basically here at iStack Training, we're trying to help the world take advantage of this incredible opportunity, uh, this once in a lifetime opportunity, the once in a generational opportunity that's, that's sort of happening right now with digital marketing, digital performance marketing specifically. Never in the world before has there been this kind of opportunity to sort of transcend social and cultural and economic boundaries from anywhere in the world, whether you're in India or the Philippines or London or Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, you know, anywhere these opportunities are available to you. And that's why we're having these conversations. We're trying to bring as much value into this process as possible. Uh, and personally, I've got to say, this year has been the best professional year of my life. I have never learned more uh, in, in, a, in a position than, than I have as the uh, CEO and founder of iStack Training. It's been an absolute thrill ride. I've learned so much about Facebook advertising, so much about funnels. That's been a big one. Uh, so much about email advertising and still learning a lot more there. Um, messenger marketing, you know, you name it. Uh, my connections that I've been able to make with all these experts from around the world have enriched, uh, you know, my knowledge of marketing to such a level that I am just extremely grateful for the way this has all gone. So again, if you like The Robust Marketer, I know there's at least 10 of you out there that do, go tell someone about it. Go share it on your feed uh, and uh, and make sure you subscribe, make sure you engage with our content whenever possible because it's, it's the fuel that we need to kind of keep going and keep growing this thing um, because we have uh, really lofty goals. Well, by the end of the year, what, what do I want to get? Joe Rogan. I want to get Joe Rogan on here. That's, that's my number one goal. I don't know if that's going to happen, but maybe Gary Vee? I don't know. We'll see. Gary Vee, if you're listening, got to come have a chat with me. We can eat some hot wings. We'll love it. Anyway, uh, thanks very much. On to the podcast. Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. I'm Eric Dick, CEO of iStack Training. And today on our 25th, the quarter century mark of my podcast, we are very lucky to have Ben Malal here. Uh, ben is the founder of the Facebook Ads Group, which has got to be the best SEO name for any Facebook group that's out there. Yeah. It's literally got to show up on everyone's list. Uh, and he is an, an amazing social marketer. He runs courses on social marketing. He runs an agency based on social marketing. His personal brand is off the hook. You just have to go to his page. It's Ben Malal to see how addicted he is to success gummies. 
And uh, I want to have a chat today with him about, about what's new in e-commerce and, and a little bit about maybe educational marketing, a little bit about his ICO. So welcome to The Robust Marketer today. Ben, how you doing? Great, great, Ben. Thanks all for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So we basically like to start on the podcast by having you give us your, your marketer's journey. So talk about how, because it's been a pretty fast rise for you, I think, uh, from like, you know, just from where you started to where you are now. So tell us a little story about how you got there. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's actually a really cool story as well. Now, a lot of people think that I've been doing this for a very long time, like for six, seven years, because I have a lot of experience in Facebook advertising and um, I do it really well, especially like if you check my name, you check my success stories, testimonials, you'll see a lot. Like I have a lot to, to stand behind, but I actually started off with really with internet marketing around like 2015, like the beginning of 2015. Not long. I actually started off. Yeah, not, not too long. Like I've actually started off just looking for ways to make money online. Now, to be honest, I knew about this world ever since I was probably around the age of 15, 16. But, you know, I didn't really dive deep into it. I'm 23 now, by the way. So like I I, um, I researched and knew about it um, when I was like 15, 16. I tried some things on eBay, some stuff on Amazon. I made some dollars, like maybe $100, $200 just like doing these random things. But uh, when I really dived into it was when I was about like uh, 20 years old, like end of 19, 20 years old. And then I was looking for ways to make money online, right? I read like the four hour work week. I read all of the, you know, the standard success, make money, make money books. And eventually what happened is I just looked for a route to take. Now, the problem with most people that start that get into it is that they get really, really, really overwhelmed by so many different things like e-commerce, affiliate marketing, Amazon, eBay. There's so many different options. And the same thing happened with me. I started with affiliate marketing, failed. I started, and then I moved to YouTube, completely failed, vlogging. Um, that I did that for a good probably three to eight months until I met this kid. I didn't really know he was a kid at the time, but I met this guy through Facebook that I saw him post these revenue screenshots, right? And I'm like, wow, like I see like these $300, $300 a day, $500 a day, which is actually nothing compared to the revenue screenshots you see now in groups. But as just like a clueless um, uh, Israeli boy that doesn't really understand online marketing, I saw that and I was like, holy shit, this is this is crazy. $300 a day, $400 a day. So I contacted this guy and he was in Israel at the time and I'm, I'm from Israel as well. So I wanted to see how I can be friends with him and, and maybe sit on a coffee with him or something like that just to just to learn some, just to understand what he's doing because you see these screenshots. So I talked to him. And we talked on and off for like, I was, I was like really, really kissing his ass for a few days just, just so, so he can give me some of his time. Uh, eventually after like two, three weeks, I gave him like some free work. I was a designer as well. So I was like, here, man, here, love, please love me. Here's some designs for your business. Eventually, like we, uh, scheduled to meet up. He lived like an hour drive for me. So I drove to him and, uh, I met up with him and he did, uh, he did Shopify, right? E-commerce, which I was, that, I knew about Shopify before, but I didn't really, see anybody actually making money in person with Shopify. This is where it was really the start of like all the e-commerce drop shipping stores. This is like three years ago where it wasn't that big of a trend at that time. Um, and I sat with him and apparently he was 15 years old, which completely blew my mind. Um, cause I, I, I thought he was like 20 something and I'm just meeting up with him and he's this 15 year old kid. And he told me, he showed me Shopify, he showed me internet marketing. And that's when I decided to go and dial into Shopify, e-commerce Shopify. Drop shipping. He explained to me the concept, buy products, sell it. Um, and I was okay. I'm gonna do it. I started selling trademark products because I had no idea that you're not allowed to sell trademark products, like a lot of people that go into the Shopify drop shipping world. Um, and what happened is I found a partner in Israel. Long story short, we moved to Austin, Texas, to get Great this started because we really wanted to take yeah, we really wanted to take a big step towards it, pretty much. We didn't want this to be just like this side hustle in Israel that we know we, we have a side job and then we do this as well. We, we wanted to like basically burn the boats. We, so we took all our money that we had at the time and we flew, uh, me and this partner, we flew to Austin, Texas. The kid, the 15 year old kid was like a, a mentor kind of for us. And we started doing that. We started like building a store, running products. Eventually it actually worked. Eventually, like after a few months, we were able to find some successful products. Now the funny thing is, is that we didn't really have a lot of money for rent or for furniture. So we had to, we had to find like a roommate, um, in, the, in the, like in a, a weird area in Austin. And we had to take like this super small bedroom, me and this partner to live together in one bedroom. I had to sleep like an, on an air mattress. He slept, uh, 
uh, on like a, a, a higher mattress. Um, we didn't have Wi-Fi for like the first two weeks. So we had to sneak into these pool, country club pools in like the neighborhoods around. And we had to do that like after 10 p.m. because that's when they close. And then they have actually Wi-Fi there. So we would bring our laptops, like, like literally like uh, some uh, burglars, and to go up the gate, sit in the pool, connect to the Wi-Fi. And that's how we would work like a few hours a day. And eventually after doing this for a two, three months, failing, learning, failing courses, gurus, Facebook groups, we were successful. We found products. We were started making money, uh, and I was like super happy. Right at the beginning, we were making hundred dollars a day, which was crazy for me. And two hundred dollars a day, and then suddenly we were making like um, I remember after only three, four months of doing this, we were making something like three, four thousand dollars a day. Now that's revenue, right? So profit would be like twenty whatever percent, then split between the two of us, which was insane for me. I was like on cloud nine. I I, I was like feeling like oh shit, I made it, right? Um, and that's basically what we did. Sixteen hours a day working, finding products, running ads to products. We did that for a good seven, eight, nine months. And then it started to kind of disgust me. That's when I tried, I started transitioning away from that e-commerce drop shipping side. Cause I really I actually got this really, really weird depression. Cause first of all, I was with this guy, with this partner of mine, 16 hours a day, we were living together. We were sleeping together. We were doing everything together. We weren't socializing with anyone. We were just working. Waking up in the morning, sometimes we would even shower like once a week because we were so out of reality. We would just like wake up, work, go to sleep. Grinding. And we would, we would, yeah, complete grind. And we would like, we're used to the stink of each other. So we don't even smell this thing. You understand? You know what I mean? Yeah. We were just like working. I didn't shave in like two months. And it started to disgust me just like the fact that there's only money to this because drop shipping and that's a lot of things that, uh, that's, that's the main thing that a lot of people here don't understand is that it's not an actual business where you're just running pro running ads to a product and you're just scaling it and then you're finding a new product. It's not really a business. It's a way to make money, but it's a very, very churn and burn. Um, it's arbitrage business. at its core, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's just completely arbitrage. Yeah. 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 And uh, most people that get into drop shipping, and I know I have a lot of friends that have been doing a lot of money, but now they're not doing a lot just because the fact that they're not evolving with, uh, with where the market is headed. The reason it was so easy back then because because the competition was less, the customer values didn't need to be that high because your cost per conversion was pretty low. Uh, anyway, so I eventually, it, it disgusted me just to work for the money. I wanted to have a lifestyle. I wanted to, to talk to people. I wanted to do something outside of just like increasing the, my money, um, increasing my bank account number. So I started helping people because I, I put a lot of value in, I, I really like, like, I'm not going to say like, I love helping people. I do, but I love the feeling of getting a like feedback from somebody that I helped. Like, I love it when people send me like, um, oh man, thanks, dude, this works for me. You changed my life. Da, 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 da. I really like that feeling. So I used to, I started posting a lot of content in groups and slowly I built my, my essentially personal brand kind of in the e-com side. I didn't sell anything, no courses, no coaching. I just helped people just because I really liked the fact of like posting things, writing, I did that for a good few months, slowly, just like organically, my brand grew. And I opened the Facebook ads group. Um, wait, before I opened the Facebook ads group, I decided actually that e-commerce is not really what I like doing, but I really like the marketing side of it. So I transitioned everything to actually doing the marketing side of it because that's what I was really connected with. And that's what I wanted to focus on. Okay. And even today with my e-commerce stores, I'm not doing any e-commerce. I'm just doing the marketing side. I have a part, I have part, the part, my partners are the e-commerce essentially guys that are finding the products, handling the team. I'm just like essentially the CMO, like the marketing side. I just run the Facebook ads, have, um, run the team that runs the Facebook ads because that's what I like doing. So I eventually transitioned my brand from e-commerce to Facebook ads, opening the group. Um, I had a few courses in the past, uh, smaller ones and the big one that I launched like a year ago, which is social marketing masterclass. Uh, then I launched that one. I opened my agency as well uh, at that time. And I basically used my personal brand to get clients into my agency. Um, and then yeah, I then slowly just like videos. I started, uh, I was, I'm a very, very social guy. Right. And then I, I started figuring that out after being one, one, one and a half years in business that I really like talking to people. So we went to a lot of, I, I went to a lot of conferences, met with people eventually growing my brand slowly, 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 or actually like some people might say like very, very fast. But um, invited to public speaking events, my agency grew, basically leveraging the group and my funnels and my automations for that. I have the course and I have a lot of side projects. I still run the e-commerce, some e-commerce stores on the side. And I'm, I'm now I'm focusing like the personal brand that, that I'm focusing now, that you saw with the success gummies. That's something that's really, really new, like the direction that I'm taking with that. I started doing that maybe like three, four months ago. But yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially the, the journey in a life, in a, in a nutshell.
Nice. So what what is the the focus right now of your personal brand? Like, so it's it, first of all, it's it's benmalal.com. Is that um, the well? The, the website is benmalal.com. Ben Malal, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. The focus is essentially like, so I don't know how much you know me in person, but I am a very I'm a very very sarcastic out there. Um, I get that from your feed. I really enjoy it actually. Yeah, yeah. Very polarizing person because I don't like the the whole how boring the whole guru market entrepreneur niche is of like these people doing these poses with Lamborghinis or with like these hot chicks in the background and like these things really make me cringe and they disgust me. So what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to build something that's basically the opposite of that. You can talk about, you can see it as a parody on the entire market entrepreneur motivational niche. Uh, and what you see until now is really just the tip of the iceberg because now I'm putting a lot of money in some video production into creating some really, really, really um, badass videos on parodies of the big gurus that we know, Gary Vaynerchuk, Ty Lopez, Elon Musk. Because I want to take that whole thing and just add something like super funny and super polarizing into it just because that's who I am. I thought that I need to be this professional. And if you see like past pictures of me, I'm trying to be this professional person with a suit and like, yes, I will teach you Facebook as I am the Facebook advertising master. I know I just didn't connect to that. You know, like I am that, like I am good at what I do, but I'm not that guy that will be like, I'm the expert. I am the best. Yeah. I, I'm that funny guy, polarizing guy. Um, I'm young, right? So I'm more of that. Like I'm, I have that mentality. It might change in a few years, but my mentality currently is a more polarizing, doing something uh, different. And it just like disgusts me, the whole, the whole entrepreneur motivational like niche, like even Gary Vaynerchuk, like I loved Gary Vaynerchuk, right? I loved him, but slowly I'm starting to hate him. I just say he's starting to like really bug me just every time seeing him with his videos and I'm like, okay, dude, you're starting to annoy me or annoy me, even though again, I'm a big fan of his, uh, but you, you know what I mean? Like it's slowly starting to get like, he's continuing to do those hustle videos all, all the time, all the time. That's like somebody needs to, to do a parody on that. Somebody needs to create something that's like the opposite of it. I like this. This is uh, and I can tell your sense of humor right on the, you know, as soon as you come to your Facebook group and, or in, in onto your, your, your professional page or whatever, and it's like, Selling people shit they don't need, which is at the core what e-commerce is, right? Like nobody really yeah, needs yeah. Elon Musk's new flamethrower. You know, nobody right, really exactly. needs, uh, you know, all these things. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's interesting the way you sort of like burst the bubble a little bit with it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but at the same right. time, it's like it is this opportunity. And I think that's what you're trying to balance, right? It's this opportunity that the, this generation has that no one has had before. You know, this ability mm -hmm. to sort of like transcend social and cultural economic boundaries from anywhere in the world, uh, you know, exactly. it, it just by, by setting up these, you know, understanding funnels, it's understanding products. It's, it's a crazy, crazy opportunity. Time. It is. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. So well, right now well, you're, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. What I would say as well is that essentially what's going on like now in the past few years, if you've noticed is that there's more and more and more gurus rising and more courses and more education. Um, and everybody is trying, starting to transition from formal education to essentially online courses and online education, which, you know, everybody says that like, oh, don't go to school. It's a scam. It's a scam. But essentially it wasn't a scam until like 10 years ago because there wasn't really a way to learn. But now there is literally no reason to play, pay like $20,000 a year or $10,000 a year to learn, especially not business and marketing because those things change so often like literally the course that i released last year about marketing i need to update it now it's only been a year and what you go if you go to school and learn marketing you're learning things that are probably like five years like five years behind ten years behind if the market changes so fast that like again if you want to be a doctor or something then you have to go to school but these things business owners and, and um, anything in that in that field you can't learn it at school you can but you can't be as efficient if you actually learn it online which will be as well cheaper yeah, no, I, I totally see this. This is something we're seeing at iStack Training as well, where people are, are coming in sort of refugees from from other situations where, where they just right. weren't getting, you know, and, and you meet someone who has an MBA and they have a lot of a lot of theory maybe and a lot of, there's yeah. some psychological things they might understand or whatever they might, they know how to run a CRM and, you know, maybe things like that. But but just the, the, the you know, working on the front lines of, of marketing and actually making conversions happen, they're just hopeless. There's nothing that teaches that in, in the school. So I'm wondering if, if they're going to learn to evolve they, they kind of have to, I would think. Yeah, they have to. It's just like evolution. It changes. Like so, formal education has only been around for like a hundred and something years, I think. It's not, it's, it's still pretty new. You know, it can always change. And it's all based on, you know, if you look at like original ideas of what education was, it's not to create unicorn entrepreneurs. You know, a, the whole point of like the traditional education system is to kind of create 
consumers and, you know, manageable, you know, normalized people. It's not really to create people that are trying to fulfill their own, you know, personal destinies, which is sort of what this online thing is all about, I think. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's true. It's 100% true. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your uh, about your courses and and sort of how you how you've gone about doing that because you had you've had a lot of success with the social media masterclass I think right or just in in its first yeah. year, and and so yeah, how yeah. did you how did you get it broad enough like how did who, first of all who's your audience for that course is it's not really like uh, it's it's a pretty broad audience it's basically anyone who wants to like in, improve their sales or leads essentially, mm -hmm. yeah so. First of all, I come from a background of sales. Before I got into internet marketing, I did about cold approach sales for about two, two and a half years. That made me really, really, really understand like human psychology and communication on a very high level. Um, and I can really say a lot of my successes because of the things that I've actually learned doing sales. I did like the toughest sales there are where it's like we would, <clears throat> we would be in a mall kiosk and lure people in that have no relatability to our product and we would sell them thousands of dollars worth of products sometimes. And these mall are kiosks. Processes that sometimes take anywhere from 10 minutes two hours sorry mall kiosks are human pop-ups that's exactly you know yeah, that's the, basically what it is exactly it's a funnel it's, a, it's literally a funnel i can take the entire sales process that we did in the kiosk and move it into a funnel and there'll be like so much resemblance it's crazy so essentially um with the course it's just a facebook ads course for anybody that wants to learn facebook ads it's i try to make it make it as broad as possible so it can, so essentially I can scale it as broad as possible. So I can essentially scale it as broad as possible and that it will touch on every single industry because the industries are very different. You know, I can't, I can't teach Facebook ads on the highest level in one course about e-commerce, affiliate marketing, local business, and so on and so on. But I can teach the fundamentals of every single one because at the end of the day, marketing is marketing. Advertising is advertising. You pretty much... If I sell you a shirt or if I if I sell you a dentist treatment, I'm pretty much using some very, very, very simple fundamentals. Resolving a pain, um, building trust, scarcity, everything is always the same no matter what the industry is. When you dial a bit deeper into it, it's different. But on the ad side, it's usually the same. And I talk about scaling. So essentially the market. And for, to do that, I actually needed to create over five different webinars Um each one basically targeting a different niche, like different audience, because I never, like everything that the, uh, we have no affiliates currently, like some of our students are affiliates, but no affiliate has ever brought more than like five sales, right? Um, I'd say like 99% of the courses is only literally from my personal brand and of course called the traffic. And I have a really good like automation funnel process with an email automation and warming up sequence that I can put a lot of value on that really helped the essentially the cold traffic to turn into eventually course buyers. Nice. Yeah, this is something that we're working on currently as well because we we have sort of a warm audience. We have the audience of the affiliate world and and the sort of like the, the you know the eighty thousand people or so that we built. But right. what we but what we don't have is that cold traffic funnel uh, that that brings people in through tripwires and lower ticket items up up through the, the, yeah, exactly. the higher ones as well, which is which is a big focus for us in twenty eighteen. Uh, yeah. Very cool. So I wanted to ask you, so you're, I, cause I've come across this actually a few times when I've asked people out there, like, what are the best Facebook courses? Who, who are some of the better Facebook minds? Your name comes up again and again. I saw you, uh, you were even on the news the other day, uh, you know, yeah. a, a month ago or so where, where you were actually asked talking about the, the Zuckerberg changes. Uh, right. but as far as your, like, uh, your know-how goes, like, what would you say your major expertise is within Facebook advertising? Is it in the, is it in the ability to like, just, uh, is it, you know, more on the creative side? Is it more on the data side, more on the, like the funnel structure side? Like what's your biggest strength mm -hmm. as a Facebook advertiser? So I said, I have a lot of strengths, but if we put it in one thing, the thing that I'd say that differs me from a lot of other people is that I, I'm, I'm a very, very, very big numbers guy. I'm very analytical. And I'd say that I can really understand how the optimization algorithm and data work on a very high level. That lets me essentially do things that all of others can't do. I'm not a copy master. I'm not a design master, but I am, I am a master in data and, and analytics. So I, I really can leverage essentially the algorithm in my favor because I kind of understand on the, like on a very high level. Like I can look at the metrics and I'll look at some people will only look at one, two metrics, but I'll usually look at like eight to 12 metrics. I'll even put on a spreadsheet, do some calculation and really understand it on a very, very deep level. Cause I'm just like an optimization freak, right? I'll try, like, even with my course automation, I, I change it probably 150 times just to increase the conversions even by half a percent. So with the course sales, um, with the, with the Facebook ads, essentially, it's, it's just like I'm really, really good in dialing deep into it. And that's why 
you can see that um, a lot of the stores that we launched, the businesses that we launched, or my students, you can see a very, very spike in scaling literally from the second to the, like second day because there I put some a lot of techniques and tactics that allow you to leverage the Facebook algorithm on a very high level to bring in a lot of sales in a very, very short amount of time. Interesting. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about too, you alluded to this earlier when you talked about how some of your friends who are running e-commerce stuff, uh, they're not, they, they saw some very good results last year, or early last year, and then they've sort of seen those results dwindle because they haven't been able to evolve with the way that e-commerce is evolving. What in mm -hmm. your mind is the way that, cause we, there's still a lot of people getting into drop shipping. There's still a lot of people jumping into the game and there's, and still people are finding little bits of success. But what I wanted to uh, hear from you was wh where do you think the game is evolving? Do you think people have to get into building brands or, or yeah, what are your thoughts about the way e-commerce is evolving? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Now I, I could actually elaborate on that question for a full three hours because there's so much, there's so much to talk about that. But if I, if I really summarize it to a few minutes, this is, this is how I see it right now, the world opportunities they come in trends they come in waves okay e-commerce drop shipping facebook ads is a wave affiliate marketing is a wave black hat supplement dick pills whatever it's a wave there's always going to be those first um pioneers that jump on that wave and see the best results okay that's what we're seeing with the people that invested early in bitcoin that's what we're seeing with the people that got into e-commerce drop shipping at the beginning that's what we're seeing in a lot of industries now a lot of people go into these industries and they make money and they think that that's it they made it but the problem is, is that the market always changes. It always evolves. Even my mom, my mom got into dropshipping two years ago and she isn't, she doesn't take enough responsibility to change with the market. And now she's not making any money at all. Right. And as much as I want to help her, I, it's not even in my control anymore because she needs to understand how a business works. And that's what I've noticed with dropshipping e-commerce. And that's why, by the way, I didn't want to evolve my brand around e-commerce dropshipping. And I moved it away from that and to, to Facebook ads because I knew that e-commerce dropshipping was going to die. And Facebook ads is going, it's gonna, it's gonna continue growing. It's not going anywhere. So what's happening now is that most people that went into it and are seeing less and less results is because it's a lack of taking responsibility and getting out of our comfort zone. So even like I'm living here with, uh, like we're six guys here and even one of the guys here, I'm not gonna mention his name, but he's experiencing the same problem and he's been doing e-commerce dropshipping for three years and the last six months were the worst in his entire, in his entire business just because he can't evolve with it. Now, the big issue here is that people that do e-commerce dropshipping, they completely rely on Facebook ads. Okay, 99% of the traffic comes from Facebook ads. Now, three years ago, there weren't a lot of advertisers on Facebook, like compared, sorry, compared to today. The more advertisers there are on Facebook, the more expensive the ads are, of course. Now, the reason for that is because there is the same amount of ad space. There's the same amount of ad inventory, but... Um, more advertisers essentially need to bid higher on that ad inventory. Now, of course, Facebook will add some new ads here. Here's some messenger ads. Here's some right column ads. Here's some ads. Here's some story ads to add to the inventory, but it's not enough for the amount of advertisers that are coming in. So essentially, the demand is higher, but the supply stays the same. And they're making and changes to their on? algorithm to even lower the amount of ad inventory there is because they want to show more yeah, family exactly. stuff, more... And now they're even doing that, which I'll, I'll talk about as well in a second, where that's even going to make it even more expensive because that's even going to make the ad inventory smaller. So what's happening is that the ad inventory stays the same, which means the supply stays the same, but the demand grows higher. So it's more expensive. The problem with e-commerce dropshipping is that the customer value of an e-commerce store that does dropshipping usually is around 10 to $30. Again, if they're selling high ticket items, they can go to 100 to 200 $300, but usually it's about 10 to $30. And that's where the customer ends. That's where the customer value completely dies because they buy a product and they fucking receive it six weeks after. I don't think that customer is going to buy again. And it's fine. Like, I don't think the advertiser or the dropshipping store owner even cares about it. Like, I still run some churn and burn dropshipping stores on the side and I just want to make a quick buck. I'm just trying to make like a few, like, um, um, a good amount of money in the next two months and I'm going to close the store. But I have my other big brands on the side and I'm investing most of my time in. But when people are investing all of their energy and their entire business is reliant on that, they're just going to die out because they literally won't be able to afford Facebook ads. If you compare that to a legitimate brand, like I have a brand that I've been running for two years. And since those two years, my cost per conversion has probably went 5x. So it literally went from, let's say, $3 to $15. 
But I'm still fine with that because my customer value is so huge that I can even pay $40 to acquire a customer and I'm still going to be profitable. And that's how legitimate businesses work. A legitimate business does not rely on a first sale. The first sale is nothing. Most businesses, big businesses, lose money on the first sale. But the problem with this niche is that with internet marketing, this is such a big trend where it's such a low risk to go into these businesses that you've got all of these, like, you know, all of these essentially, um, uh, how, how would I call it? All of these, like, um, free holders. Fast followers, like people just like uh, yeah, gold rushers. Cheap. Yeah, uh, gold rush. Exactly. Yeah, lemmings. They see this trend, and then they, all of them are jumping in. Yeah, you and they, they don't understand that this is not a business. A business does not involve it involves risk. You might jumped on a trend three years ago and made some money with e-com dropshipping. Good for you. But now the world is evolving, and you have to understand business business fundamentals to make this work. Um, and essentially, if you take a brand or a business that has a higher customer value, which means a front end sell, email marketing on the back end, upsells the the product takes three, five days to ship. The customer buys for $20 the first time. Two weeks later, he buys another product for $40. Suddenly, that customer value of the product over a year is about $400, which means that the Facebook advertiser, or like the, the business, can spend up to $200 and still be super profitable. And if you take a dropshipping store owner where the customer value ends at $20 because they're not doing any email automation, the customer does, gets a shitty product, the customer doesn't, um, the customer doesn't care about the product, he won't come back. So that's where the, that's where the value ends at $20. So if they're paying any more than $10 to acquire a customer, they're going to be at a loss and they will be paying more to acquire a customer. Because again, if we go back to what I said before, there's the same amount of supply, there's more demand. So they just won't be able to afford uh drop shipping other than the fact that now they're even trying to like PayPal are going in on this, Stripe are going in on this, where they're holding a huge amount of reserves. Facebook are surveying people about shipping times, product, product value, product um, quality, and so on and so on. So these dropshipping businesses are starting to die out. And to be honest, I'm super glad that that's happening because it will basically filter out the people that are not that, that are just not risk takers, that are not willing to take responsibility. Because that's that's how businesses work. If you take these people that are now making like, I don't know, $300 a day dropshipping, and that's whole, whole entire, um, that's their entire income, and you throw them 15 years into the past, They'll be like, whoa, 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 wait, how much money do I need to invest to open a business? $50,000? Okay, I think I'm going to stick to my nine to five job. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, it's, it's just evolving. It's really interesting. And then the other force is, and so this is, what, so this, so my answer is like, my question is, where do these people go? And so, and it, it leads me to this other aspect that that makes dropshipping even, even harder in the long term is that all these, the, the big brands of the world are waking up to the performance revolution. You know, they're they're waking up to like, okay, we we can do we can do direct marketing using Facebook. We can track conversions a lot more carefully. We can call Ben Malal and get him to look at our funnels and and you know and so so not only are the, you know like there's competition going to come from the top as well as more and more brands become more aware of how incredible these performance marketing tactics. So my question to you would be like, so these people who are trying to, to get into dropshipping at this point, like, what do you recommend that they do? Do you recommend that they become Facebook ads experts and build their own little agencies maybe and focus on the buying aspect of it rather and, and you know, let other companies who want to build businesses um, build the business aspect of the e-commerce product and, and just get really good at promoting these products? So it, that kind of depends on what aligns with each person's value. Some person will want to do this, some person will want to do that. People that are already in drop shipping and they're kind of dying out, what they need to do is they need to look at it from a business standpoint and not from a, I'm just going to make money on the side standpoint. That's number one. Um, number two, the people that are just going into internet marketing, they can go into drop shipping. It's all good and it's, it's all okay to go into drop. It's not about drop shipping dying out. It's about the mentality that usually drop shippers have of the like low risk business. Like again, one of our biggest brands, we do drop shipping, but there's a huge brand behind it. Our suppliers and manufacturers, they work exclusively with us. We're still drop shipping. Like everybody's drop shipping at the, at the end of the day. You're buying yeah. from Amazon. So you're drop shipping. It's just a tactic. You know? It's just, but it does get. It, it, that's what people name this whole trend as, which is sort of exactly. inaccurate. Right, right, uh, exactly. So, essentially, if somebody is new in the industry and wants to come in, I would say I would really suggest actually drop shipping is the best type of form of learning because there are so much aspects that you get to learn from this marketing, branding, copy, design. That like again, like that's where I started, right? And that's thanks to that I was able to grow to where I am today. You know, because it's a business. It's a business that has all of the all of the fundamentals of every business. But when they actually go into it, if 
three years ago, you didn't really need a lot of money to go into it. Like a hundred dollars would be enough to test and already have a profit. Now you probably need at least like a back of three thousand dollars to comfortably test ads. Because like when we did when we did uh, when we did this three years ago, um, I mean when ads it was. We were, we were probably spending $5 on an ad and our copy was horrible. We didn't even know what we were doing. Like, I didn't know any, anything about Facebook as website conversion. Everything was confusing, confusing for me. I just ran some stuff and like after spending $20, we we're suddenly profitable. But today that won't happen. Today you need to, one out of 30 products will probably be a successful winner, which is depending on what the person wants to do. Like, I never recommend for people to go into a churn and burn business model just because it's such a, it's such a sh like shitty business. Like there's nothing, there's no, there's no soul to it. There's like nothing to it. You know, again, some people don't care, which is fine. Um, for me, that, that's why I hated teaching it. Cause I used to, to teach e-commerce. I have even a dropshipping course and I completely stopped selling that course a year and a half ago. I, I, I removed the sales page. I removed everything cause I just didn't want to be connected to that type of model. Um, but yeah, like people that go into business now can go into dropshipping, but they have to understand that there is going to be more risk involved. There's going to be more products that, that are going to be harder to actually, um, uh, to actually make work and there needs to be more money invested. That's interesting. And there's more risk in it in the fact that if, if the, if Facebook surveys your users and finds out they're not getting their products for two months, uh, you could get your account shut down as well at this point. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. But it's still a, a sort of like a necessary training ground to evolve into something else. Like, so, so there is, and there still is opportunity for, and this is something I'm trying to figure out too. And I'm, uh, you know, talking with like Greta Rose Van Reel and stuff because she, she went at it in a different way. She didn't test a thousand products. She came up with a great idea for a product, invested in it and built it out, you know, her skinny me tea or her, or her watch company or, mm -hmm. or anything like that. So I still feel like there's great opportunity for people that have the vision and want to start a business online. But again, as you're saying, that's going to take risk. Yeah. That's the thing. That's, those are legitimate businesses. But it's, it's essentially so the drop shipping. What, what we're talking about here, that's a very short term model. But what she's doing, she's doing a long term model, which it has its advantages, advantages and disadvantages. Where she probably hasn't made a dime for months, if not years, until she actually built her brand. And on drop shipping, you can suddenly see this kid learning a course today, and a week later finding this winner product. Hey guys, I just made thirty thousand dollars today. Thank you so much. You know, it's yeah. so weird. It's a really, really weird time. Like you see these millionaires 17 year old millionaires that just like i know so many like people yeah. that are that are between ages of 15 to 18 that are killing it like, completely making more money than the president of the united states that's like insane when you think about it well maybe not this president because this president's got all sorts of ways yeah. of making money i think yeah, yeah, yeah. i, I just I, salary i love US that you salary, yeah. the sal i love that you had a 15 year old mentor that again that mm -hmm. shows you what what kind of world we live in right yeah, where, yeah. where these doogie housers out there you probably don't even get that reference because you're only 20, you're, you're a young guy too. Um, very cool. So let's switch gears here a little bit. I, I just wanted to get, I, I'm starting to ask everyone I, I come on this podcast with uh, just what their thoughts are on, on blockchain and on, on Bitcoin particularly. I, I was just talking with my, um, my head of marketing today who's like really, uh, really into crypto and he was sort of reading some signs, basically saying, okay, it's about to get bullish again, you know, where we're headed to an, another big boost here. What's your sort of overall, like, I, just let's transition into talking about crypto a little bit. Talk a little bit about what you're doing with your ICO and, uh, mm -hmm. and your overall thoughts on the space. Do you think it's, it's, it's going to just rebound in the, in the next couple months? Okay, um, that's, 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 a, that's a very cool topic. The thing is, is that people look at crypto... Okay, there's a few types of people, right? There's the people that just look at it from the side and like, oh, it's a bubble. There are people that are a little bit invested into it and then they see everything as crypto. Bitcoin, Ethereum, they see everything as crypto. And then there are people that are a bit more deeper into it, like me, where I understand the difference between the different type of currencies. Now, you have to understand, people have to need to understand that the US dollar, the banking system, has been around since like 1890, 1880. It's, it's not been a long time. It's actually been 120 years. We've been dealing with different types of currencies for tens of thousands of years, but people are so dialed in that the U.S. dollar is the is the, the currency of the world, which is not true. It's actually the most people and people say that Bitcoin doesn't exist. Cryptocurrency doesn't exist. It actually, when you think about it, it exists more than the U.S. dollar. And why is that? It's because the U.S. dollar is not limited. If, if, the, if the Federal Reserve is, is, is in debt, they can just print more out. And that, that's what people don't understand. It's like, oh, I can hold the U.S. dollar. So here, here's five dollars. This is five dollars. Yes, it's five dollars, but the value of it depends on how much dollars are in the world. So if the Federal Reserve decides to print another trillion, that five dollars is essentially now worth three dollars. 
But with Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, there is a, a higher level of technology here that, that is decentralized in a way that the value, it goes up and down, but it's a limited amount of value. There's a limited amount. So it's really similar to gold. There's a limited amount of gold in the world. And after that, after like, after there's no more gold to be mined, the value of it will rise. Now, you, when we talk about crypto, we can't talk about crypto as 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 a whole because um, or Bitcoin as a whole because there are some cryptos which are a bubble, but the thing that is in the bubble and is legitimately going to be the future, in my opinion, and if you really dial deep into it, and people that are active, that are smart and understand how the economy works and how the world works or like how a currency evolved. They can't disagree with the fact that the blockchain or cryptocurrency is going to be the future of currency. And the blockchain okay, like, specifically, the idea of the blockchain, the, the idea, idea of, of a distributed blockchain. ledger without a middleman right. that can, exactly. it, it, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of scary to even think about how revolutionary the blockchain could really be, uh, when it comes to sort of like creating a, you know, th this sort of like, it, it, when I, I, like, I'm not smart enough to really grasp it. But what, what, when I think about it, I think of like the Internet of Things. I think of the, this whole idea of the Internet of Things happening where you're going to get, you know, smart, smart uh, salt shakers that says, hey, you're out of salt. Time to order salt, basically. Or all of these different things. We're basically creating this like digital world or this digital sort of like reference to the real world. And once blockchain technology is integrated with that and there could be literally a distributed ledger for everything. Uh, you know, and that's when it becomes a really interesting, it's like a utopian or like a totalitarian nightmare, potentially, exactly. when that when that sort of happens. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super you know? weird. And there's, I think there's some yeah, limitations yeah. to that now with like in terms of the energy consumption of the blockchain and the, the speed at, with which the blockchain operates. But what are what are some of the, the, the things that you're interested in that you think the blockchain could solve effectively? So essentially the blockchain can solve effectively how currency works. Now, Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin is a bubble. It's basically the pioneer of blockchain and cryptocurrency. It's like looking at um, IBM as like the one that started the computers, that started the computer companies and like the whole mechanics of it. And then Microsoft came in, Apple came in and they annihilated IBM. But it's the same technology. Bitcoin is the pioneer. Bitcoin will not be the future of currency. Cryptocurrency, the blockchain will be the future of currency. The coin, the currency that we're probably going to use 10, 20 years from now or whenever cryptocurrency completely revolutionizes everything is probably none of the coins that we're dealing with now. Because again, like Ethereum is not a, is, is not a currency. Ethereum is a, is oil that you use to develop things. So you can't really use Ethereum as a currency. Bitcoin is like gold. Bitcoin cash is like gold. Um, how I see it is that the way that's actually going to be used is there are so many different ways because it actually takes us back to our, um, to, to like the, the agriculture times or even before that, where we're actually exchanging between different occupations, which actually is really, really similar to how the blockchain ledgers work, where you send somebody money and then it goes through, it goes into the blockchain and everybody needs to accept the fact that, that this person is actually going to send money to that person and it can be hacked. It can't, like nothing can happen to it and then it will be sent, which is really, really, really cool. And it's not centralized. Now, the thing is, is that the government might have too much power at this point that they will prevent this from growing. That's the only thing that concerns me. If the government does not take a step to actually annihilate this, then this is going to be the future 100%. But if there is, if the government suddenly decides that all businesses are not allowed to use cryptocurrencies, all businesses are not allowed to use digital currencies, every business needs to only accept the US dollar, then we're fucked, kind of. Because that's just what bad. happened in China, right? Like that's sort of the reason for this, this most, or that's what people point to anyways for this most recent sort of yeah. crash crash because it's still five times what it was in you know three years ago but uh but was that china the chinese government took a lot of steps against against cryptocurrency so it's really going to be interesting to see especially what the u.s government does long term because i think i think they probably recognize that there are aspects of it that are really attractive when it comes to data when it comes to control when it comes to you know creating this this sort of like digital map of the physical world i think there's probably a lot of things that 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 certain people in power like about it but at the same time yeah, no, they also like being able to print a trillion dollars when they want to fight a new war yeah at the same that's time why, you know that's why we're, we, we're reaching a really really weird time where this will probably this might potentially cause world war three like I can see this causing World War Three, where there's like, I think the market cap is about like what is like, um, I forget, I forget the number. Is it 800 billion or 800 trillion? What makes more sense, 800 billion or trillion? Billion, I think billion right now. 800 trillion is way is like way. I think that's way too right? high. I think yeah. 
yeah, yeah. So now I think actually the market cap went down because everything like crashed completely. But it was on the peak, it was like 800 billion, which is a very, very, very big amount. Now, if I bring some of my friends here, like the CEO founders of the uh, actually the, the ICO that we're creating, like I don't know anything almost about blockchain and ICOs and like crypto. I know very, very, very little. Uh, and a lot of people think that I'm an expert in it, but I'm not. I just understand it. But if I bring people that are actually into this, they're going. They can, they can sit 15 hours with you and explain to you exactly like all of the little details and why everything is like that. But yeah, I really believe that this is going to cause a lot of issues if nothing is going to happen because this puts a lot of risk on the government and essentially like the higher powers. If it's like the elites, if it's, we're talking about conspiracies or whatever, this puts a lot of pressure and stress on them, like a lot. Because if we change to that, they don't have any control anymore because they control the U.S. dollar. But nobody controls crypto. It's decentralized. So it's it's kind of really fucking them. And I don't they won't let that happen. They'll do whatever it takes to not make that happen. And if that means to, to cause a World War Three, then they'll probably do that. It's just a wild time. Like, you know, we, we talk about the opportunities in the in the, you know, in the uh, in marketing industry, in the digital marketing industry. You talk about crypto overthrowing things. You talk about oil all of a sudden, like all the the. The, the entrenched power that existed with the oil industries, all of a sudden they're being like, okay, our timeline is like 20, 30 years and we're done. Like what are those right. people doing with the last bits of their power? That there's, I think we're in a massive like power grab right now with all these sort of like entrenched interests trying to, trying to, you know, like yeah. cement their position going forward. It's just a wild time, I think, to, so to read between the lines. And I think it's so important to read between the lines. We're getting, we're going deep. I've ever, I, I haven't got into politics on this podcast very much, but I think it's so important to read between the lines of the news narratives that you see today, because you know, there's so much manipulation going on. No, it's completely like, I can dive in really deep into conspiracies, but I'm not going to do that now because there's going to be like, m without me putting putting in context, the conspiracies would think that I'm a madman, like me talking about that. So, but I'm going to talk about some like uh, um, some uh, something that essentially makes the most sense to me is that at this time we're living in a very very strange time, especially with uh, AI, with virtual reality, with medicine. Like, uh, do you know Ray Kurzweil? Have you heard the name? Of Ray oh yeah, Kurzweil? the futurist for sure. Yeah, singularity. Yeah, yeah. His exactly like his predictions are like by 2045 we're gonna forget a singularity, which means that essentially if we live until he's even talking about like 2035 that we'll find a way essentially to live forever. So and I actually believe that with how with how things are moving forward and essentially if you think about it how VR is, is moving forward and how AI is moving forward, we will find a way to essentially like essentially synth synthesize synthesize consciousness and actually move it over to either like a virtual reality or like a machine. And I, I'm talking about like 20, 30 years, which is actually a lot. If you look 20, 30 years back, we've went from Pong to to being in this virtual reality space is talking to each other and shooting zombies, yeah. which is insane. So what's going to happen in 20, 30 years from now? Will we be able to move consciousness around? And if so, does that mean that if we live another 20, 30 years, will we live forever? You understand? And I actually believe, I actually believe that. You know, because it makes really, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's freaky. I'm scared of it. And especially like, have you seen the Facebook spaces and what Zuckerberg is doing with that? That's like some weird ass utopian billionaire shit. But that's freaking me out. But it's exciting at the same point. Like we're living in a very, very, very weird time, you know? And I wouldn't change it, you know? Like I wouldn't change it for like to live in any other time. But I remember talking to my grandma like 10 years ago and she just like, she, she was, you know, in her, in her 80s and she was just saying, you cannot fathom how much the world has changed in my life. And, and, and yeah. she's like, you will, you'll experience yeah, it. But trying. like, you know, it, it's, it's uh, it, it's so, so we're going to have to get together at some point and eat some su success gummies and, uh, and go deep on some won't. of these, some of these questions. Cause I think, uh, I think we probably have a lot to talk about it in those areas, but I want to thank you yeah. so much for coming on the podcast today. If people want to get in touch with you, they're going to go check out, uh, that your Facebook profile, which is it's Ben Malal. Uh, check out the Facebook ads group. Anything else to reach you? Um, yeah, if, if you could just Google my name, YouTube my name, you just write Ben Mall, you can get my page, my Instagram. I'm, I'm, everything is usually interconnected with everything, so it shouldn't be a problem to find me. Nice. Okay, well, thanks again, man. Uh, mm -hmm. Have a great weekend. Thanks, man. And uh, we'll 100%. talk again soon. For sure, man. Thanks.